Okay, well, welcome to Brooklyn Law School and tonight's celebration of the launch of a new book by Professor Heidi K. Brown, The Introverted Lawyer. At Brooklyn Law School, um, we often enjoy programs featuring uh, new and insightful books by our faculty. New books by our faculty were showcased uh, at September 17th, six of them uh, at the Brooklyn Book Festival. And tonight, uh, we're gonna hear uh, from the, one of the authors of one of those books, Professor Brown, whose book sold out at the Book Festival. And I think it's selling out now. There are copies, a few left in the back. Um, and if you uh, buy one soon and then speak in a very forceful voice, uh, you might even be able to get it signed by the author. So I uh, hope that you do that. Um, Professor Brown is the director of our legal writing program and she's preeminent in her field. Um, many of you heard about the New York Law Journal sur survey of graduates and employers that found Brooklyn Law School uh, to be the second best overall law school in New York. Um, so that means we've got some ground to make up. Um, but it also, uh, to me, uh, reminds me that our director of legal writing and our legal writing program is second to none, and we're very, very proud of it. I'm also proud to say that Professor Brown and I have so much in common. <laughs> Did you hear that snort from the end of the alumni council? First of all, we're both introverts. <laughs> yeah, I know it's ridiculous. It's really ridiculous. I mean, it is actually very hard to think of Professor Brown as shy or reticent. And so I really, you know, I'm the introvert and I'm, I'm wondering whether she is. But I can assure you that the central point of her work is that there's all kinds of voices. And by her example of success, she's exemplified that authenticity and effectiveness trump power or volume in legal expression and persuasion. Um, the second thing we have in common is um, that we both share an aspiration. We've talked about this and we agree. We are aware that graduates of law school across the country, and for some time this has been the case, often, far too many times, regard their experience in their legal writing program as one of their least useful or least favored aspects of their legal education. And yes, our aspiration, we've talked about this, is for our graduates' legal writing experience to be regarded by as among their most useful and most favorite experiences in law school. And so that, nothing short of that is what we're shooting for. The third thing is, is that we're con uh, committed to continuing our school's constant effort to prepare our students for a rapidly changing new world of law, and we're committed to do so by engaging with a community of legal educators everywhere, by borrowing and sharing ideas, ideas and approaches. So Professor Brown and her book are certainly in the forefront. There's two examples I could mention uh, that uh, demonstrate this. Just recently, for example, Judge Shira Scheinlin, a recently retired United States District Judge at the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times calling for more diversity of voices in the courtroom. Uh, other judges, including Judge Jack Weinstein of the Eastern District of New York, agree and they've gone so far as to incorporate new rules requiring trial lawyers to give junior lawyers more opportunities to develop their lawyer's voice in the courtroom. But just saying we want more diversity, uh, diverse voices is one thing. Professor Brown's book and her research and teaching focuses on giving all young lawyers uh, practical and tangible guidance to communicate about the law and with confidence and effectiveness. In August, a second example is that a national task force on lawyer well-being issued a report on practical recommendations for positive change in the legal profession. This report focuses on suggestions for reducing lawyer stress and anxiety. Professor Brown's book is groundbreaking by providing realistic advice for quiet law students and lawyers to find their advocacy voices in an authentic way not by faking their way through, um, which can ex exacerbate their anxiety. Now, in these turbulent political times, um, we often experience 
uh, and are subjects of reflexive, combative, and rude discourse emanating from the highest ranks um, of our government. Professor Brown delivers an important message about the pivotal role of thoughtful, deliberative, and uh, civil discourse as an asset in the practice of law. So I believe that Professor Brown's introverted lawyer is an excellent example of this law school's innovative approach to legal education, our strong commitment to developing our students as legal writers, and one of the most valuable communications tools a lawyer possesses. Professor Brown is devoted to injecting energy into the law, and uh, we're all committed to doing so by engaging uh, with the community legal scholars, as I said. And so in that regard, um, we're very glad to have with us here uh, Professor Joe Bankman, in, in, who's the Ralph M. Parsons Professor of Law and Business at Stanford Law School, where he teaches tax and is a leading scholar in the field of tax law. Professor Bankman is a clinical psychologist as well as a lawyer. The founder of the Stanford Law School Wellness Project, Professor Bank, um, Bankman, um, teaches mental health law and rights on the intersection of law and psychology. Michael Groman, who uh, is the head of our Alumni Association, is a member of the class of 1983. He's the current president of our Alumni Association, as I said, and he's the head of the New York office and chair of the Wealth Planning Practice Group of the law firm of Dwayne Morris, LLP. And we're really um, grateful for his dedication to training and mentoring junior uh, law firm associates, as well as many of our students who end up in his firm, or many of those who don't, but to seek his advice. Tomorrow, we'll be hosting tomorrow morning, we're getting full service, um, a town hall for alumni, uh, who will be talking about our strategic planning session. We're very, very grateful for all the things he does outside of his billable day uh, for this law school. Also, please join me in thanking the Brooklyn Law School Center for the Study of Law, Language, and Cognition for sponsoring this event. And with that, I hand off to our great friend, Michael Groman. Michael. Uh, thank you, Nick. You gave away all, all of my background in terms of, uh, I never thought that I would uh, be back here leading the introvert uh, revolution so many years after my uh, graduation. Um, in addition to my leadership responsibilities, I take uh, great pride in the field of, of introversion and being an introvert. And most people say, well, you're not an introvert. You get up and you speak in front of people and you talk. But uh, I've started to learn over the last few years as to what the whole science and, and background is about. And the way that happened was uh, we had a meeting of our firm in, in Philadelphia. And by the way, my, my partner at law, Fred Cohn, is here. So we, I know them being videotaped, but everything, I'm trying to be candid and don't go running back with uh, what I'm about to say. <laughs> but um, they decided to do a modified Myers-Briggs uh, testing, that's what it's called. And so they gave us 20 questions or so, and we filled them out, and then they plotted us um, on a chart, and it was like watching a terrible uh, football team that you root for, because the score was 40, uh, 41 to four, in terms of all the, the scatter plots were all over there, and, and I was sort of in the other side, and that was sort of the moment where I realized, number one, that I was different than a lot of the other people there, and, and also that, um, that I started to learn uh, about the subject matter. At that time, there was uh, another uh, book which is quoted in Heidi's book. It was a, ref a reformed lawyer um, by the name of Susan Cain. It's really started, I guess, the Quiet Revolution, which to this day, every morning, I get an email from the Quiet Revolution in terms of how to prepare for the day. But it sort of really helped me learn as to, I don't know what I thought of, that I was before that, antisocial, socially awkward, I don't, and, and I just exhausted all the time, um, but actually gave me a clue as to why I would come home and the phone would ring and my wife would say, you know, answer the phone. I said, not really. I said, first of all, it's never for me. And second of all, I could promise you whoever's on the phone, I don't even want to talk to anybody because I'm, I'm home and it's like enough. So I started reading about, um, about uh, being an introvert and the qualities that hopefully a lot of us uh, share. Uh, I've always been uh, proud of being a good listener. 
um, listening and being empathetic to others. And it turns out I think everybody here who's, can, you're gonna be, if you're not an introvert, now you will be an introvert by the end of the one hour CLE after a couple of drinks. Um, so I started learning about it and it really gave me insight uh, to myself in terms of why I am the way I am and why on a weekend all of my friends can't wait to get, get golf clubs and go, to the, and go to the country club and have somebody park their car and play four and a half hours. And all I'm excited about is the camera that the fellow's using in the back and, and that's the kinds of things that I do on a weekend. So I'll go out four or five hours with a camera and the only people I talk to are strangers. And when I want to talk to them, I don't have to talk to anybody if I don't want to. So what does this all mean? We're in a law school and so it's very nice to sort of challenge ourselves to learn about introverts, but it's actually, I found that the more you learn about it, the more it's really a challenge. First of all, identifying that you're an introvert and not just you know, you know, socially you know, uh, abnormal or something and, and the kinds of things you need to stay strong, but also I find it extremely tricky <laughs> just on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, sort of surviving in a large law firm. Now, every, the people in my law firm, and Fred is among them, you know, wonderful people, but when the score is 41 to four against you, you not only need to realize you know, what, you're, what, you're, what you're about, but you also need to develop you know, strategies and how to get by because everybody's always racing in this day and age to communicate, to, to talk to you, and the art of listening is gone. And when we, when we have the, um, the law students uh, join us from Brooklyn and other law schools, we do have to allow other schools in every once in a while. But the first thing you know, that I tell them that the, that the two most important answers to when you deal with clients is to say, I don't know, and I'll think about it. And that's in this day and age, these kinds of things are really, really hard. So one of the challenges, and I, when I read Heidi's book, it was further empowering me because not only does it help explain how I got here, but I think more important is you know, how, how do you survive, not only in, in a law firm, but in other settings. Um, I was thinking before, um, you know, scratching out some notes here that, you know, being an introvert to me is sort of being a part of the underserved. And when we talk about, uh, you know, uh, pe you know uh, lawyers who suffer from, you know, depression and anxiety. I mean, if we have um, women's initiative, you know, for women lawyers, how do we power women lawyers? We, for the most part, try to come up with arrangements where we bring them together hopefully and men too, and you sort of try to empower them. For, you know, for diversity and inclusion, we do somewhat similar techniques. You try to get people together by numbers. If I sent around an email tomorrow and said to the lawyers in my firm that we're gonna have the first meeting of the <laughs> introvert initiative, um, there would be nobody there because the first thing that an introvert wants to do is not go to a meeting like that that they don't have to. So I don't know. So I'm gonna turn it over to Heidi. I am extremely grateful. I had the pleasure of meeting her at an alumni meeting about six weeks ago. And um, I learned uh, pretty uh, soon on that she had written this book. And it was like, I, got, I have to get the book, I have to read it. And it was really very insightful to me. And for those of you who after my remarks still uh, doesn't, doesn't feel compelled, to come to the uh, introvert side, at least you may have a little bit of an uh, idea how to deal with people like me. And I think it's important because in lots of uh, professional settings, you have everybody who wants to be faster than you, they're smarter than you, they have to, they have to, they don't listen, they just give you information. And now the trick is, you know, how to sort of balance the playing field. And I think um, that there's a lot of strengths in introverts that are not as um, dominant and those who aren't as, uh, as uh, on the introvert scale. So I will turn it over to our experts. Thank you for writing the book and spending uh, so much time on it. And I look forward to a lifelong of uh, empowerment because it's never, you can't just say, I've reached enough, I've, I've gotten there. It's always, it's always a process. So thank you very much. <laughs> First of all, Heidi, congratulations. Thank you very much. I should say that uh, I'm a lawyer and I'm also a psychologist. I saw a pre-publication copy of Heidi's book and I was so impressed, not just by the accuracy with which you described introversion and anxiety, uh, but also by your stories. 
And so what Heidi and I decided we would do is we would recreate a little bit of a podcast that we had, and you can find that podcast and many others, if I may uh, push my product, uh, on the Stanford well, uh, Law School wellness page. So every month, my partner and I uh, interview terrific people that have something to say about lawyer wellness. Uh, if you don't, if you promise not to tell anyone else, I think Heidi's our favorite guest, however. <laughs> so Heidi, I wonder if we could start off, if you just share one of your great stories. So take us to the place where you're a lawyer and you're introverted and you're also pretty anxious. Yes, yeah, so when I reflect back on my law practice, I was a construction litigator um, for about 15 years before I got into teaching, which now teaching is my favorite job I've ever had, of course. Um, and I reflect back on the, the, probably the toughest moment that I had as an introvert and as a socially anxious individual, because those two are layered on top of one another for me. And it takes me back to this deposition that I had in New Orleans. So. I was a litigator, we had this case, I was representing the plaintiff who was an owner of these um, senior living facilities around the country, and we had to sue one of the contractors um, for breach of contract for installing the wrong material underneath um, the soil. And so I, of course, got stuck doing most of the depositions in New Orleans, and I had prepared my long, voluminous um, legal writing uh, deposition outline, I was very prepared. And I went down to New Orleans to take the depot, and we had the deponent was represented by the contractor's attorney, but they had brought in all these other de defendants. So there were about nine male lawyers in the room, and the deponent and me, and of course the female court reporter. And the, de the, de the defense lawyer on the other side loved to try to intimidate me. And so I was there with my little outlines and my turtleneck to keep my blushes from showing, and I had a scarf around the turtleneck. And I had my outline, and he used to chew on an unlit cigar to try to stare me down and intimidate me. But I you know, kept going with my, my little outline, and I'm sweating through my turtleneck and my scarf. And this time, the, the staring me down with the cigar wasn't working. So he decided, at one of the breaks, he rolled a television set into the deposition room so he and his co-defendant buddies could watch a high school baseball championship during my deposition. And you know, my heart is beating out of my chest, kind of like it's doing right now. And I thought, I don't know what to do. Um, am I supposed to mirror their behavior and fight? Uh, and this was before iPhones. I couldn't text my boss. I couldn't email my boss in the middle of the deposition. So I waited until the break. And I found a phone, and I called my boss, and he said, just handle it. I didn't know what handling it meant. I didn't know, should I, again, should I mirror their behavior? So I decided to take the quiet approach. And I had my outline, and even though I was sweating and hot and red, I ignored the TV. It was on mute, so it wasn't like it was loud, but I ignored it, and I kept going with my outline. And I just kept checking off the questions. And maintaining eye contact with the only one person that really mattered in the room was the deponent. He did start giving me all kinds of information because no one else was paying attention to my questions. Um, but I didn't realize that at the time because I was so anxious. And I didn't know if my quiet approach was the right approach. I thought I was going to be fired. Um, I didn't know what was going on. But I just did it my way. And it, it turned out to be a good result because I did get a lot of information out of him at that deposition and a few others. And then I used my legal writing skills and wrote a motion for summary judgment, attaching all of those deposition transcripts. And we ended up winning part of the case on summary judgment. So now when people hear this story and they say, oh, well, so you had a winner day that day. And I, don't, I look back on that as one of the most traumatic litigation experiences of, of my 15 you know, plus career. Um, so other people look at it as a success, but I looked at it as, as a really challenging moment for me. As a quiet person, I didn't want to fight, and as an anxious person, I didn't know if I was doing the right thing. And so. what are you thinking about as your, your heart's racing, you're starting to sweat, you're wearing clothes designed to hide the sweat, but I bet it's making you even hotter. It is, because who wears a turtleneck in New Orleans also? <laughs> and I, was, I had all these self-protective um, uh, you know, garbs on me, and it was having the opposite effect. And, and so I just, 
every time I used to blush or sweat, I used to feel like everyone could tell. Um, I mean, they could tell, and they would stare at me with their cigar and, and make it worse. And eventually, I ended up kind of shedding all of those self-protective um, layers. But in that moment, it just made the anxiety feed on itself, feed on itself. And thank God I had that outline, because I just kept going. What I love about this story is it tells two things. First of all, it's a kind of jujitsu type approach where the quiet person, the good listener, can actually do something the bully can't do because the guy with the cigar is not a good listener. Kind of reminds me of something. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, so, so this is an introverted strength. And it also brings up the whole notion of anxiety, which isn't really the same as introversion, but some people have that as well. And you're doing a number on yourself as you're worried about sweating. To hide it, you're making yourself hotter. And of course, you're then worrying about it more, and so on. I wonder if you could define the difference now between introversion and anxiety, because both are in that story. Definitely. So in, in society, we tend to lump those labels together. If you're quiet, or you're introverted, you're shy, you're socially anxious. But they're actually very different categories. And so introversion is processing information internally. Uh, you're reacting, you're absorbing stimuli from all different angles, noises, smells, sounds, people speaking. And you process that internally, sometimes in a slower, more methodical manner than, say, an extrovert who gains energy from other people and is willing to kind of jump into the fray. Um, social anxiety is, and shyness are different. That really is, is a whole different category of fear of judgment. And so this can be um, judgmental situations that have happened to you as a, as a child or layered on in high school or college or law school that are then triggered by similar performance situations for you later on in your life. So in analyzing yourself, it's, it's really helpful, it was for me, to figure out, okay, I have, I have introversion, and I, I re-energize myself by being alone, as Michael was talking about. I, I run for the hills every time I, I have to speak in, in public. I need it to decompress afterwards. But social anxiety and shyness is totally different. It's, it's that fear of judgment and, and being critiqued. And I think of when people talk about social anxiety, I think of the kind of catastrophic thoughts that you might have if you're anxious. Because it's a cop-out, in a way, for anyone that isn't uh, suffering from that to say, of course, everyone gets anxious. Well, maybe somewhat. But everyone doesn't get anxious the way people with social anxiety get anxious, full of catastrophic thoughts about, for example, what is the meaning of your sweat? Right? Yes. And so if, and I, as I, by the way, as I look at the audience, I see some people going like this. So uh, people that, that suffer from this know what we're talking about. Indeed. I mean, I tend to build events like this one up into something equivalent to the Super Bowl halftime performance in my head. And, you know, and, and we build these up, these catastrophic situations that, oh, if this goes wrong and that goes wrong, my career is over. You know, I'll, I'll be broke, <laughs> I'll have no place to live, and it, it just feeds on itself. And both of them, although they, they can be incredibly non-instrumental, they can also be incredibly instrumental. I mean, introversion we've already talked about, it gives you a kind of a thoughtfulness that someone who gets too jazzed and too energized is likely not to have. He's going to be into the fray, and you can kind of sit be beside it and uh, have better judgment. Uh, social anxiety, which is fear of being judged, it also comes with it a real acuity about what other people are feeling. You're always looking to see how people are reacting to you and to others. So it also gives you a lot of skills as well. Definitely, and it was really a, a light bulb moment for me, which is why there's a light bulb in, on the cover of the book. When I, real when I started studying this, and realizing, wait a minute, my introversion and my anxiety were not negative. They, they were actually what made me an effective lawyer. But it took me forever to realize that was happening. And I had to understand, 
what the strengths of introverts bring to the lawyer table, because we're not taught to, to be quiet as lawyers. Um, but quiet people are good listeners. They're absorbing, they're using those stimuli and, and trying to understand what's going on in that deponent space or that opposing counsel space. What are they afraid of? Um, they're thoughtful, methodical thinkers. They think through problems really deeply. So for students who, who are having trouble responding to a Socratic question sometimes, it's because, in, in my opinion, they're going really deeply to try to vet and test their ideas before taking them prime time. Um, they're thoughtful, methodical writers. They have empathy for others because they can read pain on other people's faces or fear or joy or excitement that someone who's just talking constantly might not be absorbing at the same time. And I, I'm, I'm not trying to make this an introvert versus extrovert fight, um, but it's just looking at introverted lawyers in a different way that brings strength to quietude. Because sometimes if we call on someone, I'm a professor and I call on people, if they don't say anything, there's a thought, well, maybe they just don't get it, where the reality is they get it so well that they see all the ambiguities, they're trying to work out an answer, whereas someone that isn't anxious and isn't an extrovert and maybe not be quite as thoughtful is willing just to come up with something at the top of her head and superficially sound better. Right, it, the, the introvert, or at least in my experience and from what I've studied, is seeing a lot of different layers and nuances to these complex issues and really wants to test them out before just saying them out loud. And so that's why it's sometimes a slower process of getting from brain to mouth, because it's really, really going deep to make sure that it's, it's correct and, and thoughtful. You know, another thing I really loved about the book is how concrete it was. You found things that worked for you. And I wonder if you'd share with the audience, because I know you're all going to buy the book and, and read it, but some of you probably haven't finished it yet. So I wonder if you could just share with the audience some things that make you stronger. So I, I thought I would think about what got me to being able to do my job a little bit better and then what I do now, because it's kind of two different approaches. So to getting to a place where I embraced my quietude and, and my introversion, um, I had to do a lot of mental reflection and physical reflection. Because for me, a lot of my, um, my quietude, but also my anxiety was bottled up in me physically. And so I did a lot of really listening to what the messages were popping into my head when I would have a performance moment. Whose voice was I really hearing? It wasn't really the law professor asking me about diversity jurisdiction. It wasn't really the judge questioning me or the opposing counsel. It was messages I had kind of um, ingrained in myself as a kid and, and as a high schooler and as a college student. So I was reflecting mentally on, on what was not effective in my new lawyer life. And then physically, I had to really analyze what I was doing physically to make my blushing worse or my sweating worse. I don't know if you've seen me, but I, I've crossed my legs a thousand times up here, and I have to uncross my legs. Because when, I, when we get nervous, we close up, we become small, we block off our heart, our air. And I had to really learn that's what I was doing. And the turtlenecks and scarves were not helping my you know, stance. So, um, so I did some mental reflection, physical reflection. And then I came up with sort of a mental battle plan and a physical battle plan. And now I have to, every single day, reinforce both of those strategies. So mentally, I read an amazing book by the author Julia Cameron. And she wrote this book called The Artist's Way. And she recommends every morning you write three pages of, of just whatever is in your head. And you can stop at three pages, but it, it, you, know, you have to just write out three pages. And so I, I'm constantly buying different sizes of journals. <laughs> and no matter what size I'm working with, I fill the three pages, I shut it, and go. And I never read it again. If you read it, you're, you're going to go down a path you don't want to go down. So, and I've just found that if I do that every day, even before I've had a cup of coffee, it just gets those messages that are always in there out of my system and onto paper. Um, so, and then I always have a mental battle plan for each each performance I have to do. For teaching you guys, I, I have to have a plan. I have to have an agenda. Um, I'm not a winging it kind of person, so I have to write out everything I'm going to say. 
gotten better at winging it in the moment, but um, but I, if I don't have that that writing to fall back on, it makes me more nervous. Physically, I have to work on that constantly too, because my physical manifestation of, of stress is my heart really races, I want to close up, the blush happens, um, I get really blotchy and stuff like that. So I have to work out every single day of my life. And if I don't, I start to get a little off kilter. So I take classes that, that push me in a direction I probably would be afraid to do. And um, so I, I do the cult of soul cycle that I know some of you do. But I also started taking boxing lessons. And um, it is one of the most intimidating things I've ever done is to walk into Trinity Boxing Gym on Duane Street in Manhattan where a bunch of guys, you know, retired Olympic boxers are boxing. And I go in there and I do that too because it, it helps me in the performance moment realize, okay, if I did not keel over after 45 minutes of boxing in a 90 degree gym, I can make it through 15 more minutes of teaching, right? Or, you know, a, a, a deposition or a, um, a presentation in court. Do you ever think you're boxing the guy with the cigar? <laughs> it's funny because what I was taking group boxing classes and one teacher would always say, imagine someone, you know, that you are really angry at. And it was around the time of the election, not to get political, but I was, you know, channeling some energy in that direction. But then I had another different teacher say, instead of picturing someone that you're angry at, picture someone who really inspires you. And I found it changed my workout even when I would picture someone that, would, that I admire creatively or um, want, to, want to emulate in some way. You know, there's so much in what you just said, but putting on my therapist hat for a second, two things strike me. One is what a magic pill exercise is. And for anxiety and depression, it's the number one go-to uh, empirically, and it beats the number two go-tos by a mile. Uh, the second thing is your description of realizing maybe where some anxiety came from, something in your past. And I find that can be very freeing for people because when you're a little kid, anxiety might make sense. There are a lot of things to be anxious about. It might even be useful or seem useful. But when you recognize why you adopted it way back when, it's sometimes easier to shed now because you can see, I don't need to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so the, the, this is definitely a very personal, personal vulnerable um, topic for me because when I was reflecting back on kind of my mental challenges and the messages, I was raised in a really religious environment and my brother and I, um, when we would share or kind of develop political opinions or religious thoughts that differed with my grandparents or my parents, there was a, um, I don't want to say this, I love my parents, I'm very close to my parents, but um, we weren't always encouraged to have opinions or have or develop opinions that differed from other people. And I, I realized that I developed this sort of protective mechanism around that. And then suddenly I go to law school and I'm being asked by my con law professor to have an opinion about literally everything. And I thought, I, I am, who am I to have an opinion? I, I didn't feel worthy to have an opinion about these complex legal topics for fear that I would uh, disagree with someone. And so now I realize that in my anxious moments in, in teaching or in faculty meetings or in, uh, you know, in, in presentations I do at conferences where I know people are going to disagree with me. And, and it takes me back to those moments when I was a kid of, of not feeling like it was okay to say something that people would disagree with. And now I have to be like, okay, no, this is, this is my experience. This is my life. I'm sure there's a lot of things in the book that people don't agree with, but this is my experience of, of being a law student, practicing law, being a law professor, and being someone who has really thought she was struggling with introversion, but now loves being an introvert, and, and definitely struggles with anxiety, but now understands what an important, real, real authentic um, aspect of many of our lives. You know, when you say struggle with anxiety, if you read the book, it really movingly covers this part as well as the introversion too. And one of the things that struck me the last time we talked is how you ended up dealing with the fear of blushing and sweating. 
which for anxious people, if you're not anxious, it's like a color we don't see. But if you're anxious, it can be a big part of your life. And you described something that happened in a class once. I wonder if you could share it. Yes, so I actually have two of my former evidence students sitting in the second row and one right in the front row here. And maybe you guys in the back too. So I taught evidence at New York Law School and it was 135 students, which at first I thought, wow, what a great opportunity to expand my teaching. And then I realized it was 135 students. How, how am I gonna do this? Um, and I practiced civil litigation, as I mentioned, for many years, so I knew the civil evidence rules back of my hand. I could recite them. But the criminal law rules sometimes would throw me. And I would have my PowerPoints and my notes, but a student in the back of the room would always raise his or her hand and ask me a tricky, nuanced question about evidence. My face would turn beet red. And they could see me. I mean, they were as cl closer than you guys are. And so I had just, I was, researching this book and I had read a book by Erica Hilliard and she explained that blushing, she reframed blushing for me and said that blushing is a sign that life is coursing through you. you know, you're alive <laughs> and it's, you know, it's your, it's like little footprints on, uh, whatever. So <laughs> I started saying to myself, yay, I'm blushing, I'm alive, woohoo. And so in that evidence class, I remember once I needed to think about the answer to the question. I just didn't know the answer to the question. I, my little introverted brain needed to process the criminal aspect of the rule. My face was on fire and I said, look, I know I'm turning red right now. I'm not gonna have a heart attack. I'm okay, um, but I'm turning red and let's work through this answer. And the answer came to me and it was fine and my blush went away. So I, I've started to just be the blush, you know, <laughs> yay, I'm alive. Um, and it goes away much faster, whereas when I used to try and hide it, or you know, many, many people um, will point it out to me, wow, you're so red, are you okay? And now I just, I'm like, I blush, this is what I do. It's part of my process, so deal with it. <laughs> and that technique is so powerful. It, it really changed how I approached it um, and, and got through it in those moments. And then I started applying that to other things. Um, you know, I, my heart always, always races before I'm gonna do anything. And it's instinctive, it's not gonna stop. I'm not gonna stop blushing just because I want to stop blushing. My heart is not gonna stop racing in anticipation just because I want it to. But it's, it's catching yourself a little faster and saying, no, this is normal, this is a normal process. I'm just gonna uncross my legs, open up my stance, breathe a little bit better, and this is my process, and it, it works. It really works. It doesn't always go perfectly, but I know that I can make it through, and, and it's not gonna be a catastrophe. You know, there's so much in the book about what to do if you're an introvert and, or you're anxious, but there's also a question of what the rest of us should do and what law schools should do. And I, I wanna be mindful of our time. We don't have a clock up here, but my guess is about 10 to eight, is that? Mm -hmm. Am I about right? Okay. So what I, what I want to do in this last section is talk about how we could all change. I mean, what would it mean to be more inclusive for introverts or folks with anxiety or folks struggling with other things going on? I love this question because my, I definitely understand that all lawyers need to be able to communicate about the law. And obviously we're in law school and many of you are in law practice and we have to be able to speak about the law. We don't have the luxury to just hide and write even though I'd love to do that. Um, and so for me, what, what we as a community can do is, is start talking about this as a reality for many of our law students and, and lawyers. The messages that I received, not, not to be negative, but the me messages I received over the years were, you know, fake it till you make it, or you know, get over yourself, just do it a thousand times and you'll be fine. But I'm, I'm telling you that doesn't work. And so what I would like to see is, let's acknowledge that talking about the law is harder for some of us than others. And, and as faculty, we can do that straight up in class. You know, as, this is harder for some of us than others. That does not mean you are not cut out to be an incredible lawyer. It's just we need to come up with ways to 
give you a time and space to get traction in your authentic voice, because faking it is not the answer to me either. So talking about it, um, really being open to listening to students and junior attorneys about what they're actually afraid of. Because I didn't really know what I was afraid of. I just knew I was afraid. And to get, are they afraid of the logistics of a deposition? Not knowing what one looks like. What to do if a guy rolls a television set in the room. Um, and, and really get, taking away the stigma of talking about being afraid in the classroom or in a, in a boardroom or a courtroom I think would be really helpful. And then providing practical suggestions. Well, you know, Heidi, after we started talking, I started thinking about how about me? I'm, I'm not introverted. I get energy from speaking with people, and that's what extroverts do. If you're extroverted, the more people you talk to, it seems the more energy you have, and vice versa if you're not. And I notice that I privilege extroverts in my class. Mm -hmm. I like people, so I love it when students <laughs> chip in. Even if they say something stupid, I'm giving them props, right? Yeah. So what's happened? All the extroverts take my class. They all get props, right? And I get to know them. If they need a reference, a recommendation, I know who they are. I know a little bit about their life. I see them somewhere. I say, how you doing, George? I, what, what are the introverts doing there? How do I get to know them? There's no space for them because we extroverts have a good time in my class. So. What I'm thinking of, and you're the first people uh, to hear this, is I'm thinking of trying to put up a space for introverts, maybe a blog. Yep. Something that the introverts are naturally going to uh, be a little bit more sympathetic to. It's going to resonate with them. They can blog some reactions to class. Extroverts aren't doing We're too busy talking to take the time. And I'm just wondering, not that that's the right answer, but I'm wondering if others out there, maybe in Q&A, uh, can start thinking about what they could do. Some, some of you are in my position, you're professors. Others of you are lawyers, you've got associates. What could you do to make it easier for the introverts and just to make sure you're actually having kind of a level playing field instead of privileging one group, really without a reason? Because I'll be honest, a lot of the things the extroverts say in my class, right off the tip of their head, Tongue, excuse me, it's really stupid. I mean, we know that, right? <laughs> Let, to, to play off that, um, there is nothing more exciting for a professor to read something that a student has written from a student who probably has never opened their mouth in class before, and you see the most beautiful piece of insightful, deep thinking legal writing. Oh, it, it's, there's nothing like it. And I've heard other professors who only grade based on one exam. And they read all the exams, and they're shocked that the top student is often the student that never opened their mouth in class. And so this is why I feel like we do need to create opportunities for quiet students to have a different, an alternative form for participating. And I, again, I understand that we all need to be able to communicate about the law. But this is a new language that we're talking about. And for 1L students, at least, a lot of us just needed time and maybe a different forum to, to think about the law. And that comes out through legal writing. We need us all to be good legal writers, too. And so why not give that as an option for students who aren't really ready to wave their hand in the air and, and just say whatever comes out? <laughs> I find that, too. I, the best student is often someone I don't know. And then, of course, I feel a little bad. This is a terrific mind. I never got to know him or her. And that's because they're quiet. And I know that happens. But somehow, I, as of yet, have not changed my behavior. I want to empower, because it's not always the professor just sometimes, you know, we're trying to accomplish so much in the classroom. And we have our syllabus and our learning outcomes. So I want to empower the students to who, the, the quiet or nervous students to go to office hours and, and bravely say, I am scared to speak in class. Um, and you might not get the response you want, but that's OK. You're taking the first step to say, look, I want to participate. I'm prepared. I'm doing the reading. When I don't know the answer, it's not because I'm not prepared. It's because my brain goes blank. I can't think. I'm scared of what so-and-so sitting two, you know, two seats down is going to think of me. And I can't think, but I'm prepared. So I want you, professor, to know that. 
And will you help me um, come up with a way to show you that I'm participating in class? I think that would be ama an amazing start to a real relationship between professors that just don't get to know the quiet students. It would be terrific, and terrific to do in the rest of your life, too. Uh, Ian Ayers and some other people and I have a piece in this month's Journal of Legal Education about a program that might help some students do that. But if you're one of those people, there are a million resources around. But the important thing is you got to empower yourself because as of yet, we don't have the right environment for you. Right. And also in law practice, too, there were many times that I tried, I was trying out my authentic voice. And it wasn't what my mentors or my bosses wanted to hear. So you do need to be prepared that not everybody is going to be on board with this quite yet. But, but know that, that I am, and, and there's a lot of other people who understand what we want to accomplish, and that our profession needs your voice. So even if people are going to constantly tell you, just do it, grow a thicker skin was one, another one that I was told, um, just fake it. You and your, you can know that you don't need to do that to be a great lawyer. Um, and if the person who is assigned to be your mentor in the law firm or, or is your boss or signing your paychecks doesn't get it, that, that's okay for now. Um, we can come up with a plan. You just need an action plan mentally and physically to step into every lawyer moment and, and you can still have an impact. Heidi, is there anything that we haven't talked about that I've missed or is important to, to get across before we hear from the audience? Um, I think that what I want to convey is that this is not a flip the light switch, you know, quick fix solution to being a quiet person in the legal profession. It takes time. And, and I just want to reassure you that if you try some of these things and it doesn't work, that's OK, that is normal. I'm telling you, I have to do this stuff every single day to, to be able to do my job and, and do it hopefully well. So it's, it's not, and it's not like we need to fix ourselves. There is nothing wrong with us. <laughs> we just need some guidance to figure out the best way to do this authentically and a little more amplified than we might naturally want to do it. So I think it's more of a, an amplification of our already um, powerful, but quiet voices. But I'd love to hear from students and faculty and practitioners and anybody who has any questions, comments, or thoughts. Yes, Harriet. Oh, we have a microphone, too, so it's for the video audio. Oh, OK. Well, I haven't read the book yet, uh, so you may cover this. I don't know. But I'm just wondering uh, what you both uh, would have to say about this mindfulness movement in the law and whether that is part of something that fits within your subject matter or it's just completely separate? Sure. Um, so my legal writing textbook is called The Mindful Legal Writer. Um, <laughs> and I didn't even really know what mindfulness was until I started studying introversion and, and anxiety. And so I think mindfulness really is about, I, I don't have the exact definition off the top of my head right now, but it's being present in the moment without judgment. And I'm paraphrasing John Kabat-Zinn's mindful, I, I think that's the mindfulness you definition. You got it. And I, someone wants to find for me that anxiety is worrying about the future and depression is you're stuck in the past. And so I do think this mindfulness in terms of dealing with your introverted moments in the classroom or the boardroom or the courtroom and social anxiety on top of that, it's, it's not catastrophizing and worrying about what's going to happen. And it's also not rethinking what you just said, which I do all the time. The second I walk out of here tonight, I'm going to be wishing I'd said this and said that. And it's maybe allowing yourself to do that for two or three minutes and then saying, no, OK, it is what it is. It's done. And now I'm in a new moment right now. Um, I, I had never been a meditator. Um, I thought I, I used to get mad at myself because I was a bad meditator. <laughs> and now I realize it's not about being a good or bad meditator. It's just doing it. And so I've started doing that through this app, the In Insight Timer. And you can't possibly be a bad meditator because you just set the timer, and it tells you what to do. And then the t timer goes off, and you've meditated. And I, I think it's working. So. Um, 
I just have found myself a little calmer. So if that sort of answers your question, yes, I think all of this ties into being a mindful lawyer, being a mindful law student, being a mindful law professor, being a mindful attorney, judge, mentor, and all of that. How many people here do some kind of mindfulness? It's a kind of a big growing movement. Big number of you. You know, the, uh, I was recently part of a trial that pitted the best in talk therapy for social anxiety versus mindfulness. And mindfulness, this idea is it's all just about being in the moment, it has nothing to do particularly with why you're anxious or how you can address anxiety. It just says focus on where you are right now. And uh, the good news is the talk therapy uh, did fantastically well. People really did get better. But mindfulness did just as well, and this was uh, had hundreds and hundreds of subjects in it, even though it never mentioned the word anxiety. So it just shows you how powerful it is, because a lot of people get benefits from mindfulness wholly apart from anxiety, of course. You could mind, be mindful to deal with depression or just have a better life. I probably should wait until I've gotten approval for this, but there, there's a student group called Mindfulness and Law Society, student organization. I've been talking to Will and, uh, and another two I'll name, Reza, about trying to form that type of group here. And we can really benefit a lot in, in law school. Approved? <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Thank you. What other questions, comments? Yeah. Um, Ruben, doing my Socratic method to my 1L legal writing student, Ruben. <laughs> uh, so while you were speaking with your story, I couldn't help <clears throat> but think about my own personal experience. And now when I read the book, is there a certain way to take myself out of it to fully engage? Because that's often hard to do. To take yourself out of to to fully engage in, in in trying to, you know, be mindful. I want you to engage. I want you to reflect on as you read the book. The first three chapters are basically laying out introversion, shyness, and social anxiety, and the assets that quiet people bring to the legal profession, and then but also the challenges that introverted and quiet and socially anxious people encounter in law school and law practice. And then the rest of the book really is these seven steps. It's that mental reflection, the physical reflection, mental action, physical action, um, identifying situations in law school that you know you're going to experience anxiety, but having a plan for how to attack them, having a pregame and a game day plan, and then reflecting back on that. So that's where I think your life is it's, it is the book. This book is you. It's, it's not the first part and some of it's me, but it's really you, too. At least that's why I wrote it, because I wish that somebody had helped me you know, a long time ago. And I can only help people if I get brutally honest with my lowest points, and it's all in there. <laughs> so I think, you'll, I, I think you should embrace your story, and, because you're going to be the one practicing law and helping people. I don't know if that answered your question, but. <laughs> Dana. Hi. Um, so you gave some examples about being in the classroom and uh, being in practice in the deposition. Another important part of building a legal career is expanding your network, bringing in business, making contacts. It seems like. Uh, Many introverted people, maybe me, um, <laughs> have no problem standing in front of a giant group of people, but are much less comfortable in a one-on-one -on -one kind of let me tell you how great I am situation. And I wonder if there are some different strategies that are mentioned in the book or that you could elaborate on in that setting. Sure. So, yes, I am the type of person that likes to stay home on Friday and watch Law & Order episodes one after the other. So going to parties is not or going to networking events is not my jam, as Sarah Prager would say. Um, but I learned that instead of trying to sell myself or figure out strategically who is important to talk to in the room, I actually looked for other quiet people at first to get myself comfortable with, with networking situations. And there's always more than one of us. Um, 
I, I don't like to be thrust into small groups or paired off or uh, break off in groups of four and go chat. You know, in, in our spinning class, when they say high five your neighbor, I'm like, no, I'm good. Um, <laughs> but so it helped me to, to, first of all, figure out physically in the space where I feel comfortable and then look and take time and absorb the space and see who else is, is kind of quiet and start with that person. And then in terms of selling yourself, I don't think we all need to really list our resumes every time we go to these things. What, what worked for me is really connecting with somebody better on a human level, what kind of music they like, or what do they do for exercise, or do they travel. Start with something that you feel really comfortable with and, and make that person feel listened to. And then that develops into a more natural conversation about the law or about job openings. I've been really trying to think about how to help quiet students with interviewing because that's a very stressful, judgment-oriented environment. And yes, the interviewers are making kind of knee-jerk assessments on personality and are they bowled over by your personality, but I, I really want quiet students to be authentic. And I think the same type of connection, you know, research where the people went to school, but also see if you can figure out what, again, what type of music they like or what their other interests are. You can tell a lot by someone's office um, what kind of art they have on their walls, what their desk looks like, and connect on things that are really more personal without trying to impress people on the law. The law will come into the conversation. Um, but connecting with someone authentically, to me, is the best networking tool that anyone could have instead of trying to brag about legal accomplishments. So that's just a start, I think. It's a great, a, a great question. Uh, I had two thoughts that push in different directions. One is maybe make use of writing skills and emailing and texting because these days the number of people we see face to face as opposed to the number of people we can reach in other through other means, it, that ratio is changing. The other is small talk is really hard for some people. And I want to acknowledge that, that as a therapist, some people can speak before 500 people, but it's a small talk that's the hardest. And interviewing is actually easier for some of them than just being at a kind of a social occasion that has some business connection. Now what do you do? And uh, the good news is if it's really important to you, there's lots of techniques you can use. And I'll throw out uh, uh, three initials, which is CBT, sometimes the cognitive behavioral therapy, social anxiety. If you go on the web, there are terrific resources, but small talk is a thing that if you're anxious is often the hardest for you. And there's a whole kind of protocol built to help people make small talk because it can be so hard. There's other approaches as well. I just wanted to throw that out. And on the small talk part for introverts too, um, there's some research in the book about how those types of conversations feel uncomfortable because they're not authentic conversations. And, and introvert, the science says you know, introverts crave authenticity. They don't want to be fake. When I was teaching at New York Law School, we did a lot of simulations in the 1L legal writing, legal practice program where students had to simulate client interviews. And my introverted students would say it was the fakeness of the scenario they had a really hard time with. And, and because it was small talkish at first. And so we really tried to work with how do you make how do you make small talk not small? Make it meaningful and, and impact, impactful. I know Dean doesn't like when I use the word impactful. Um, but really make it a real conversation about something that that person really cares about instead of um, just how's the weather today kind of thing. Um, over, over the course of my practice, I've had the opportunity to interview many law students um, who were looking for a job some from Brooklyn Law School, and the one thing that's the common thread with all of them is all, all, all of the introverts, as an interviewer, you just try to get out of them something that they were excited about that's on that one piece of paper. And once you get them to do that, they turn into magically an extrovert and they're excited about it. So um, that's really the way to look at it, and it never fails. I mean, somebody 
who doesn't have an exciting experience or something they get excited about in three years of law school, you probably don't want to hire them. Um, and I think that's really the minority. And um, that's all they have to keep the focus on, and that's going to come out. De I definitely agree, because the, the quiet individuals that we're talking about here have really rich inner lives, and they have a lot of interest, lots of reading, lots of, um, lots of engaging with the world on a, on a deep level, and there's a lot of information there to, to draw out of, out of them, for sure. Um, I, I like it when people will disagree with me on this in terms of interviewing, but I really like it when I see interests on a resume because I, I feel like it shows something um, meaningful about that person that doesn't come through with, with their transcript and all that. I know that people are on the fence about interest, but for, for quiet people, you might even think of an interest that even if you don't put it on your resume, you, you um, talk about in the interview. Lots of introverts in here. <laughs> well, I wonder if I could then maybe just close by, I wonder if other people could take the challenge a little bit for themselves of thinking one thing they could do to kind of open up the field for introverts or someone that might be anxious or someone with other issues that they're not doing now. And just give it a try. I mean, you don't have to think it's a good idea. Just say, I'm going to brainstorm. I won't reject the idea because it's not perfect. And then let's see what it's like for a week or two. And if you're willing to do it, I would love to hear if it's successful. And I bet Heidi would, too. You could just I send one of would. us an email. I'd love to hear from all of you. I'm so thankful that so many different walks of, of my life are here, so I'm really appreciative. I also really wanted to thank our dean and Marla, his wife, and the whole event staff. Liz Alper did an amazing job of putting this together with Chris Gibbons and Clorinda and, and Linda Harvey and really everybody. Um, I'm really thankful that you all came tonight. Thank you.